again everybody. I'll keep this short because the video is quite long. Um, it's a bit of a rag bag of things which needed to be done before I could glue the top onto the back and sides, closing the box as they say, and the bulk of it which is um, binding the, the whole body and in particular the arm bevel which uh, you may remember is the first time I've ever done anything like this. So I hope you enjoy it. This is where we're at now. Fully bound body and um, ready for the neck to be uh, worked on, which I promise I will do in the next video. I promised it for a while, but I will get around to it in the next video. I hope you enjoy it. So that's the curve shape, but I suspect it's going to be probably three or four millimeters lower than that. Um, so I'll sneak up on it. I'll, I'll start by removing that amount of wood and, and just keep refitting the top and um, we'll get there.
just going to put a dab of shellac over the uh, signature because it's only in pencil and my constant rubbing while I'm fitting this arm bevel bit on the side is going to smudge it so uh, this will just protect it. The whole of the inside will be shellacked anyway before it's glued on. So. body is now ready to be bound but um, not quite because before we can start that process we have to engage in some of every luthier's favorite activity which is sanding. Uh, we all love it. Basically um, we on the top we want a completely flat smooth surface and on the sides smooth curves because when we come to cut the channels to put the binding in any irregularities on on those surfaces will be telegraphed into the binding channel and it will look terrible. <laughs> I've just finished sanding the top. Um, I'm going to put another coat of shellac on it. Um, just as a protective layer, it'll all come off later in final sanding. But um, I thought I'd take a moment just because it's interesting to me at least to see how near I am with the rosette. And you can see that um, there's some scuffed patches on the inside and outside of the ring. Um, that's just the meniscus of the, the liquid. But I think that may mean that I don't need to put any more lacquer in, which would be good. These bubbles, incidentally, up here, I didn't bother to, I didn't bother about because um, they're all going to be covered by the fretboard. Um, any bubbles here, I, I popped and made sure were uh, gone before it, um, before the lacquer began to set. But um, anyway, uh, I just thought I'd show you this. Um, I'm quite pleased because there's very little if any left to do on that. I've finished sanding the top and the sides now prior to binding. Um, you saw me using a random orbital sander on the, the top. Uh, you'd never do that at the sort of final sanding stage. That would always be by hand with the grain but at this stage it doesn't matter if you get um, sort of small cross grain scratches because it's all going to come off later. For the sides, I used um, this sort of a tool first. Uh, this is actually an inflatable one, a really clever idea. Um, 
and that gets rid of any ripples and cups and bows in the across the the width of the side um, and that's followed by normal sand hand sanding with hard blocks to smooth out the curves um, this for the inside curves obviously and um, and then that just to maintain a good shape um, so I think I'm ready now to cut the binding channels which uh, I'll have to do by hand around here I'm sure where this um, arm bevel is but uh, we'll see how that goes this is my um, arrangement for cutting bindings as you can see it's just a, a palm router mounted in a, a sort of gantry thing which means it can move up and down it's um, sprung at the back so there's actually very little weight on it uh, it's free to move um, then underneath it's a little hard to see but the cutter is there then there's a domed plastic part of a domed plastic washer here which rides on the top or the back of a guitar depending on which um, binding you're cutting and then this copper piece of copper pipe rides on the side of the guitar which is what transmits the shape of the binding or the shape of the guitar into the cut at the top it, it's hard to describe but it it'll make sense when uh, when you see it working um, I've set the cutter at the moment to be the height of the little purfling strip which will go inside the binding and I'm going to do some test cuts on scrap um, to for the width of the cut because the the cut must go from the edge of the guitar which would be here finally the cut must go in the width of the binding and the purfling and I've set it up roughly but um, it's always a good rule to test on scrap but it's very important to do it with this particular operation to get it right just before making the actual cut with the the router cutter I'm going to go around with this tool a grammel which has um, a knife blade mounted in it and you can set obviously to the width of the the cut that you want going into to the body of the guitar from the side um, and like the rosette cut this um, just breaks the surface fibers and helps ensure a clean cut from the the router going to show you the present state of this um, groove which is obviously like the rest of the 
cut just for the purfling. It looks very rough at the moment, I know. Um, and in particular, there's a little spot there where I accidentally, with the file, managed to... It's surprisingly easy to do, actually. You try and hold the file in the groove, and you have to press down and up to the wall, but it, as soon as the file trips over, it's going to mar the, um, the surface. So I'm going to try and steam that out a little bit. Some of it will be a cut, but a lot of it will be just compressed fibres. So I hope it'll um, come out and be invisible. And the rest of it, um, this bit here, I'll tidy up later. Basically I wanted to get this part in, in the state where I could uh, route the second channel for the bindings, so the deeper, shallower one to take the binding on the left here. Um, and then I'll tidy the whole thing up. Um, the main tricky bit will be to get a smooth curve here, which is the, the line the eye will follow uh, on the bottom of the binding, and that white line will will accentuate any um, any sort of wobbles or uh, deviation from a smooth curve. So that's going to be the tricky bit to do. I forgot to switch the microphone on just now. Um, total incompetence. But basically what I was saying was that the steam will um, swell any crushed fibres. It won't get rid of um, any anything, any cuts in the wood. And, you know, a, a misjudged file stroke will obviously cut into the wood as well as crush it. But I think it's going to be all right. Now I'm going to set the um, this jig up for cutting the binding channel, so the taller, thinner bit here. So I have to set the cutter depth. You can see it's only about a third of the depth of the binding at the moment. Um, I have to, so that's the depth of the cut and the um, the width going into the body is set by the difference by the pr amount of projection of this piece here which is controlled by a just a screw, a simple screw at the back. So as I advance this that gets the makes the cut shallower and shallower. And this is incredibly crude. Yes the router is unplugged. I think I've got the uh, cutter set up properly now. It worked um, well on my test piece, piece of scrap. Um, but I'm going to test it also on a on the real thing, but on a part which won't show because it's going to be covered by the neck, well the heel. Okay, here's my little test cut, and you can see that I need to go in a little bit deeper because, okay, it's not long enough to to sort of accommodate the whole of this little test strip I've got, but you can see there's a gap between the purfling and the top wood, so, and also the uh, the binding projects beyond the, the side, so I need to go in a bit deeper. Third time lucky, and that's got it, it's nice and tight. Now that the binding channels are cut, um, we have to think about what to do at the end of the guitar, um, because this seam needs covering up. And what I'm going to do, which I've done before on several guitars, is basically um, make an extension of the binding that sort of links the, the top and the back of the guitar. And so what I've done is <coughs> I've glued together two offcuts from the binding strips because they're all longer than they need to be 
um, and I'm going to basically get rid of one of nearly all of one of these bits of ebony here so I'll be left with a single strip with white black on each side of it so basically I'm going to cut away all the ebony except the half millimeter that will stay on the outside of the white to match the half millimeter of black on the outside of this side and then that strip will go down between the the binding as it comes around here it'll look as if it goes down and joins the binding on the back So this is how we do the join at the um, where the two parts of the back binding and the back strip all join together. I've cut a little, um, not a test piece, but a, um, a piece to help me get the mitre right on the end of the end graft, as that strip is called. You can see I need to trim it down just a little bit more and then and then I'll put a mitre on the white black that's just there which will match the mitre on what will be the binding but for now it's just my little guide piece. Okay, that's spot on. So now all that's left is to mitre that little black-white strip to match the mitre on the on the um, template or test not test piece. What do I call it? So there it is, and I'll do the same on the other side, and in fact then on the ends of the binding pieces I'll do this, so that they should meet together in the middle of the end graft, butt up against each other, and each side will be mitered to match the end graft.
with my plan the binding will be full height as far as here and then it will be thinned down as I said before. The consequence is that the purfling which I normally glue in with the binding and glue to it will have to be glued in on its own around the curve and then back together with the binding once the binding is up at full height again. And then after the the thin binding down here, the, just the black white and a tiny bit of the ebony, once that's dry then the wall can be built up and glued onto the purfling here. Okay now this is interesting. I may accidentally have come up with a better plan. I was sewing these kerfs with the intention of chipping out the, um, the top section leaving just the thin bit I've been talking about to bend but this is actually so flexible now that I think if I cut a couple more I could actually leave it as it is and um, bend it like that and then I would just need to fill in the kerf marks um, with ebony dust and glue afterwards as I would have done with the other kind of join which I was planning to do. So quite by chance I think I may have hit upon an improved plan. Just goes to show doesn't it. So that problem of um, a slight kink in the curve uh, where, the, where the bends started and at the most extreme point um, due to a sort of partial breakage almost of the, of the binding that reminds me why I normally use fish glue for bindings and not tight bond and why I should have done this time because fish glue is a lot easier to uh, reverse and soften again than tight bond but tight bond will with a bit of heat and moisture so I've I've heated this up I wet it and heated it up with a, a small flat iron and um, as you can see I'm using spool clamps to apply pressure to apply pressure in what I hope is the the right place and the curve does seem to have smoothed out so we'll We'll see how that looks after it's sanded down, but for the time being I think I've fixed that particular issue. Out of interest, the method I use is um, I said I pile up um, ebony dust in the cracks, fill it with super glue, you end up with a sort of um, heap of dried ebony dust um, on the surface which you sand down but the final operation, the thing which makes it hard to see, is um, putting just a, a, a thin layer of super glue on the surface of the ebony and then uh, sanding with very fine paper. And that kind of makes it much more uniform. And it's that bit that really renders it not invisible, but certainly very difficult to spot if you're not looking for it.
so how do I think the arm bevel went? Well, I guess I'd give myself about a 7 out of 10 perhaps, which for a first effort isn't too bad. You want it to be flawless and it isn't quite. Um, parts of it went much better than I expected and I screwed up other bits. Um, but all in all I think it was a, a good decision to try it. I'm definitely going to do another one. And I'm certainly very happy about the sort of comfort aspect. I think it's going to be great to play. Um, and for the rest of it, well, I'm pretty happy with the the rest of the body. It's um, it all seems fine. So um, looking forward to the next stage where I get on to the neck. I really will next uh, next time. Okay, bye for now.